gospel reading this morning. There will be a gospel reading, um, some gospel in the preaching. So those of you who have that need to stand and do that stuff, apologies today. Um, before I begin and pray about uh, the message, I did want to take uh, the moment to honor our brother and friend, Dave, um, and celebrate his daughter's wedding to Tom, who many of you uh, will remember from days gone by. And um, I don't know if they shared with you, on Monday morning when I went to the airport to fly to Auckland, we were on the same flight. So I got to bless them and send them off once we reached Auckland. It was lovely to see them. They actually looked a lot more chilled and rested than I thought um, they would be in such a tumultuous time. But it was a beautiful celebratory wedding and, and reception. And we were quite honored, Suzanne and I, to be included. So, ta. Yeah. Have you guys recovered? Uh, just. <laughs> Bank account still has a dent in it. but <laughs> No, it was lovely. It was over at St. Peter's and uh, a beautiful day. You could have filmed a rom-com with the wedding and the reception outside around the church. It just had all of that beautiful feel to it. And, and they had two songs that we sang during the uh, wedding and quite often in weddings, people are singing the songs, and yes, they're worshiping. They are. But there's other times when the Spirit shows up and the whole of everybody there is worshiping. It was magic. Aye. And, and Samson Knight, who uh, is the vicar at St. Martin's over in Addington area, he, um, and has been Tom's vicar, as Tom's been the youth pastor there, was doing the wedding, and he gave all the men permission to cry at the beginning of the service. And even way in the back where all the Anglicans sit, um, there were men doing this, which gave me permission. So it was great. So let's pray. Loving God, I am but a human being. And I'm going to try to communicate in word and in heart, what it is you want said. I pray that you would guide me. And I pray that our hearts and our will would align to yours and hear what you have for us. That we might be the people of God, the people of this book, to know and understand and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, is that it? Yep. So if, here's a question. If we really believed in God, really believe what, that God loves us, would we be as fearful under pressure or negative circumstances? Would we compete wrongly? Would we be jealous of others? Would we be able to live past the imposter syndrome that we don't measure up? Would we be able to strive and celebrate when another is promoted and recognized, and we're not? Because see, God's love for us, I'm going to need your help because it's not playing. There we go. Did I do that or did you do that? Okay. I'll keep trying and then I'll just point. Um, the thing that you know is that God's love is unconditional. You know that you didn't earn it and you don't merit it. The older you get, the more we know that. What our hearts have a hard time learning is that you cannot unmerit it. Think about that. And I think I wrestle when, and I, 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 as bold as to say, I don't like when somebody says, oh, I so wish that, that Shane would come to, to know Jesus because he would be so great in the kingdom. Now, I, I get what they're saying, right? But the converse of that is, well, James isn't special, so it's not really a big deal that he came to faith. Or Alan has seen more summers than me, so he's not as useful or as valuable or as celebrated in the kingdom as Shane. Do you get what I mean? We, we go into this productive economy of somebody's worth, not realizing that we have such favor and such love from God. Now today I'm supposed to be talking about the word and the credibility of the word and, and, and making the word central in your life. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to give you the sermon of all of the critical reliability historically and um, 
the texts and archaeologically, that's not my point. You've heard, most of you have heard that stuff. The fulfilled prophecies, that's not my point. My point is this love of God. And that's the center of what we do and why we do it. Oh, it worked. What'd you do, mate? Don't know? Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, Most of you have seen this passage where Paul writes in Romans, look, there's nothing that can separate you from God's love. Absolutely nothing. And I love this passage. And here's what I wanted to get you. And this is about God's word that I want you to catch. And having seen the crowds, he was moved with compassion. You know, sheep without a shepherd, blah, blah, blah. Well, not blah, 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 but my point being moved with compassion. I want to tell you a little bit about that, that phrase. That very complex word that even with like six classes in Greek, I can't say, which is moved with compassion. But what it really says literally is moved in his inward parts. But the core word of moved in his inward parts is actually the word womb. That Jesus was moved in the very center of his being. Now, I'm not talking biology gender. He was moved in his womb, the place and center from where all life comes. He was moved so deeply for those people. And if we could grasp that in our hearts as well as our head, our approach to scripture would be very, very different. Anyone in this room who's had the privilege of that moment understands that. You hear me blatter on about my kids all the time. Imagine me on that day. There's a picture of me with each of them sitting in it. They always have a rocking chair. Sitting with each of them. They've just been cleaned up. I got to clean up and wipe all that white stuff off of them and wrap them up. And I'm sitting there in a rocking chair and I'm just weeping with this beautiful joy. Because something that defies prose or poetry happens in that moment for mother and father. There's a love that you did not know existed, much less was possible within yourself for this beautiful creation. And if we could understand Jesus loving us with that same great love, how our lives would be different and how we would treat what he wants to say to us different. We've all experienced the family reunion. Family reunions are great. Do not get me wrong. We love our family. Don't get me wrong. All the family in Wellington, I'm not talking about you. But we also know, particularly the older we get, when you go to these family reunions, there's some people you love because there's a shared DNA chain. And, yeah. (laughs) Because in the middle of the week or next week, There's no way you'd want to hang out with them. There's no way you'd tell them the the deep personal stuff. You love them because they're family, but there's not that shared ongoing relationship and there wouldn't be. Chapter 3 of Genesis. This is God's relationship. Where every day he would come in the cool of the day once the heat had broken. And living on an island, we know, uh, with our ozone hole and all, it can be so blistering hot, but once that sun reaches a horizon, the temperature drops and it suddenly is so pleasant. And he would want to come, not have a class with them, not do training with them, not sit there with a checklist of accountability, had they been and done everything they were supposed to do, but to be with them. But most of us approach our relationship with God... And I say that with confidence. Most of us approach our relationship with God in a family reunion way. You show up at family reunions because you're going to hear it from your mom if you don't. Right? We, we, we know we're supposed to. We appreciate it. Yeah, but it's not the same as those intimate relationships. When I'm walking up Mount Summers two days ago, and I've got Nathan doing the talking, so I'm not heaving like the emphysema patient, one of the questions I asked him was this, when did your faith really change and come alive? And unsolicited, he tells me this story of church and faith and trying to be sincere and 
being kind of discipled and mentored, you know, somebody that you know well enough that you can be vulnerable with, and they're going to encourage you and, and guide you, not hit you with the ruler over the wrist. For the young ones who can't imagine that, back in the day, some of us, that was our reality, <laughs> particularly good Catholic schools. <laughs> And I asked him that, and he said, when finally I could hear this person telling me, and I actually started getting into the word, and it came alive. How did it happen? I don't know. I just gave myself to it and pursued it, and it came alive. And it reminded me in something I hadn't thought about in a really long time, of God's word coming alive in a magical way. At my desk at home in my study, um, there is a prayer kneeler here, and it's got a Bible I've had for 35 years. And almost every page has the highlights and circles and lines and studying a, a word study here and a cross-reference there and underlining and seeing the original text on some pages gets harder than on others. And it reminds me of the, when I fell in love with that. Wanting to be a person of the book. But for many of us in church, being a person of the book, the first, you, you know the answer is not supposed to be this, but emotionally we feel this, that actually it's to get the rules right, a system of making life work, of getting some kind of religious piety, some existential experience emotionally. And most modern Western Christians will know the lyrics from songs of another generation. Those of you who are over 18 probably know most of those songs and could continue the, the one line that it gives you from each song. And those of you who are over 60, 65, 70, you remember those songs firsthand and you can still sing them and know all the lyrics. You're sitting there reading them all, aren't you? How many of them do you know? All of them. We know these, but we know so little of the word. We draw inspiration from these. But when we come to God's word, it's quite often like a family reunion situation. Now, I am not saying that to beat anybody up. I'm saying that, that that's our reality, and that's what's been on my heart for a long time. This sermon has been planned for a long time. I've got 2023 planned. But... As I went through my holiday and just reflected upon this, this became my journey with God. That in this desire to know God, we approach it in those, those rules and those expectations and those pieties and not someone who wants to tell us such deep things about himself or about us. And if you value something, it, it, here's the difference between a value and an aspiration. An aspiration is, yeah, I value that, but it doesn't get a lot of attention. If somebody goes, oh, I really value this, I'm, I'm going to use a metaphorical phrase. Okay, show me your diary and show me your checkbook. Because what you value, you will give yourself your energy and your resources to. And if you value God's word, then it will have space in your diary. And so a lot of us want to, but we don't. And it's never really come alive, and it's kind of remained at the family reunion level. And a lot of our teaching and understanding of Scripture is secondhand through pastors, teachers, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to let you in on a secret. A lot of pastors and teachers, theology and understanding and teaching is from pastors and teachers who handed it down to them. In the last century... Starting in the 19th century, this argument for a place in the public square became the center of teaching, and people are still teaching from that mindset, and it's not what God is doing and moving and saying or how he's saying it in this time, but people aren't doing the firsthand time with God to hear from them. They're teaching or knowing or drawing conclusions off of things in the past, and they're often not always well-founded. But if we're going to be a people of this book, what would that look like? We know that the Spirit has given us that word. In the first century, they would travel great distances 
great distances, hundreds and hundreds of miles, to go to a temple where they would have some drugged up oracle who hopefully might have a word, a sentence to guide them in life, to make life work. And that's about all they'd get. And they would hope, and if you got for it once in your life, that's probably about it. And God has given us this big, thick book with all the story, but the meta-narrative, everything that goes with it, guided by the Spirit for us. But yet, as, as Western Christians, we just don't really love and know the book. When I would go to Burma each year, I was amazed that they would have one copy of one gospel, and they would divide it. And Sonia would take chapters 1 to 6, and Suzanne would take 6 to 12, and Sandy from 13 to the finish, and they would devour it. And they would copy it, hand copy it. And then they'd trade. They would devour that scripture and know it and love it. One of my favorite stories is the road to Emmaus. Now, Jesus on the left, this is a thousand-year-old painting. Give them a break. Right? They didn't have paint by numbers to learn. You got Jesus on the left, you got Cleopas in the middle, and you've got his wife, not the most becoming painting, on the right. So it is what we know as Easter morning. It's the day after Sabbath. Jesus was killed on Friday, Passover. You've got a couple of hundred thousand people who've traveled to Jerusalem for Passover. It's the day after Sabbath. They're all starting to head home. The people who were Jesus followers are really scared, so they're hiding. And they're heading back home because they don't want to get crucified too. And they may have family relations. They may have an elderly family member they need to get home to. But they're walking to Emmaus, about seven miles west-northwest of Jerusalem. And as they're walking along, they're talking. And they don't recognize him for whatever reason, not the point. Jesus comes up and goes, what are you talking about? And they begin to tell him, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened to this prophet? And he did all these things, and our rulers killed him? And it goes on, and they're despondent, and they're sad. But I loved them. And, and you know, when you listen to an audio Bible, you foolish! It sound you know, like Jesus was furious at them. The disciples didn't get it. They're not going to get it. He goes, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then in the yellow, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Suzanne and I had a, a seminary professor who said every verse of the Old Testament is pointing to Messiah. I couldn't see it at the time. But now, several decades later, I can see how every chapter, every story, Every book, every theme, the meta narratives and the small ones all point towards Messiah and God trying to share Himself with us and us back to Him. But I love verse 32. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Have you ever experienced your heart burning, coming alive when you read God's word? And if you haven't, it just makes me sad because it changes everything. When we approach it the family reunion way, the rules, the piety, we miss who is speaking and what he's saying to us. The focus of all of this isn't to give you a code to live life, which it does. It isn't to help you know right from wrong, which it does. It isn't to have some emotive experience with God, which you can, but it's to actually know him, really know him and understand him and be safe, completely safe. Too often, we and how we understand ourselves in life is shaped by social media than it is by God because it commands so much of our attention. And brainwashing, repeat the same story and over and over and over until they be believe it. We allow ourselves to be brainwashed by a humanist, pluralistic, very lost, sad society 
rather than God in his word. We know that the words of life are in that book. We know that when we go our own ways, we do what's right in our eyes and not God's. We know that we're told to be in that word and to be exposed to it and constantly remind ourselves and to teach the next generations. Do you remember me telling you the story of the rabbis in the first century taking the clay tablet with the text written on it for the children, at, starting at two, who couldn't read yet, drizzling the honey on it and having him lick it off and him reading to them? Well, he could quote it, actually. The word of the Lord is sweet. That, look at that. You see, the, you see the father there? He's wearing a mask. That's contemporary. That little boy, the word of the Lord is sweet. Making it central. Making it the source of life. We know Paul's words on how to parent. But I put in those brackets that word because we get discipline and you go back to that audio Bible. The word of the Lord is... And that word discipline, we always think of it as a, a punitive. But an athlete being trained, cricket, rugby, netball, doesn't make a difference. Chess. A coach disciplines the player, trains and instructs the player to be their best. And that word is so much bigger than just the discipline, which is where we go. Our hearts go because we don't know him and trust him at that level. And that it's the showing of the way and the coaching and the instruction of the Lord. My favorite song. Have any of you ever heard of Casillo? Casillo? Started in Spain. Um, a, it began with the Catholics to get Catholics back in the word. It was during the Spanish Civil War. It got expanded across the world. The Anglican Church and being organized as we are, moved it across the world. It went from the Brisbane Diocese to the Wellington Diocese, from the Wellington Diocese to all the dioceses across New Zealand. And I was helping lead a casillo. I had a table of, of, they normally do women and men. I had this table of men on this retreat for, for people who've had some faith but haven't fallen in love with Jesus, who actually are thirsty but don't know how. And the leader of it, with no warning, was talking about Scripture and the value of it, and if anybody could stand up and without the Bible in front of them, quote their favorite passage of Scripture. Okay, now being a priest, you like don't volunteer first, right? You kind of sit there and wait. I'm trying to learn to be Kiwi. Don't stand up. And he calls on me. But I was able to stand up and quote the entire psalm because this is my favorite psalm. In the first couple of verses about, you know, favored, blessed, is the one who doesn't do this, but does this. The favored one who allows that word to infiltrate into them and shape and form them. The psalmist goes on with this great desire. Sorry, it's in the King James Version. I like the picture more than the version. Um, Show me your ways, O Yahweh. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you're the God of my salvation. On you I wait. Not on your instruction. On you I wait. Today, being formed by social media and other causes, I wrestle with so many Christians who basically are co-opting God to legitimize their cause. Their cause may be really good. But when they think about their faith, they think about their cause and not his face. They don't fall in love with him and therefore they want to see his kingdom come as they live it out. They think about the social justice cause, not him. And if that comes to your heart before God does before Jesus does. And when we do that, our manifesto, our theology, our framework for life becomes what whatever segment of society you listen to. 
your identity politic or your, what I call your tribal identity. You, don't, you haven't thought through or, or studied the scriptures for your position. Your tribe, your group has told you what to think about topics. Notice that I have some on the left and some on the right up there. And they all co-opt God for their cause, good or bad. Are we seeking Jesus or are we just using him for our cause? Have we weaponized God in our social tribalism in battle? We know that sometimes when we don't know the scripture and we haven't wrestled and spent time with it and we haven't been taught well, we take scripture and we use it incorrectly. This is one that any parent has heard, known, memorized, printed and put up over the crib, train them up in the way they'll go and they won't depart from it, which, yep, that's great. But Proverbs is wisdom literature. It's to give you wisdom. It's not a mediated contract. Because if you take that and you don't do wisdom literature well and you take it as, if I do this, God does that, sign on the line, God. When that child gets older and goes sideways, a few of us in the room have had children do that. It's God's fault. He broke the contract. I did my part. And we actually believe in a God that doesn't exist I quite often dealing with uh, young adults, young men. I'm going to be getting together with Ben again. He's one of these. eh? He's like, I don't believe in God. And I I have been doing this a day or two. My pistol's loaded. (laughs) Oh, yeah? Which God do you not believe in? (laughs) Oh, that's cool, because I don't believe in that God either. I know. No Anglican priest is supposed to believe in God, really. But... I actually do, just not that God. And it opens up to a bigger, better, deeper question. You see, when you don't handle Scripture well, and here's kind of the the, the exhortation to you. When you don't handle it well, it will lead to false conclusions about who God is and how we're supposed to live our life. Anybody know the the metaphorical phrase, which we will all know? Drink the Kool-Aid? Does everybody remember where that comes from? Jim Jones. Jim Jones was a pastor in L.A. who moved his entire church by twisting scripture to Belize. And as people began to investigate their children and family members who've gone off with this cult, a a U.S. congressman and a delegation were going down there to try to figure out, is this a cult? Are these people okay? Are they being... And he was just going to have some conversations. They arrived... And he had gotten over 900 people to drink the Kool-Aid that had cyanide in it. For those of you who are the Google generation, the Google babies, just go look at the horrible photos of hundreds of people who have been given Scripture incorrectly, drew false conclusions about who they are in God and what God wants from them. Every one of the major cults that broke off from Christianity or even claimed to still be in Christianity began with poor handling of God's word. This isn't new. Paul's entire letter to the Galatians was about this topic. And so with that creating a little trepidation in some people, quite often they won't engage in Scripture because they don't feel confident that they actually know how or they don't have the skills. So I want to give you a couple of things. Please give me grace. It's my first Sunday coming off holiday. And Thursday and yesterday, that killer hike in between, um, I was working on this, and so I confess before you, my brain is still a bit discombobulated. So it's going to be about how you approach Scripture as well as a couple technicals of how to approach Scripture. The first one is knowing God is about knowing God, not about all these rules. And the people who get turned off to God don't get turned off to knowing God. They get turned off by this perception of rules. That word there under B that I've given you before, lev, it's translated heart. But for the Jew, that heart was the center of the will, the center of the attitude, the center of the posture, as well as the emotion. All of yourself being in a trusted relationship. It is a technical manual, sure. 
But the technical of how we live life or don't live life is a reflection of the relationship at the center. And being pragmatic Westerners, we go to the technical without the knowing and trusting God. Because when you actually do know God, when the horrible situations come, I don't understand why or what, but I know who. And when you don't know who, you're overwhelmed by the why and the what. But so approaching Scripture to actually let the Spirit, which I've given you a lot of verses, and of course in the verses that were read, and those are just a a, a layer off the top, of God bringing his word for us to tell about himself. Oh, I need to go back. i got to hit this there. Under A, floor time. I asked Jay if I could do this. You know Jay. Jay's a kid who at 21 will wear a onesie in the middle of Christchurch and never for one minute feel self-conscious. Right? He will come in in the afternoon having been at Westburn. Josiah will always come in, touch base, say hi, what's going on, and he's off to do next. Jay comes in and does, sir, collapse a lot along my carpet. No, he doesn't piddle. He lays down on the floor and stares at the ceiling. And I'll turn around and I'll look at him. Just need floor time, Dad. Okay. Now, about 20% of the time, after 10 to 15 minutes of silence, he may ask, hey, Dad, how do you? Or, Dad, I'm frustrated by. Or, Dad, you wouldn't believe this today. But 100% of the time and 80% of the time without one of those statements, he just lays on the floor and he calls it floor time. He just wants to be with me. I'm working away. I'm like the ever-ready bunny with new batteries. I'm going at it, and I'm doing it. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, and I'm, I'm going. But he just wants floor time. What if we approached our time with God like floor time? What if we sought it out? And out of being with God came the questions or the complaints or the explanations of, Number two, a lot of us approach scripture, you know that misreading of Proverbs? That's using wisdom literature incorrectly because it's the whole of the Proverbs to help give us wisdom. It's not lines on a contract. The staff team, we have been going through the first seven chapters of Proverbs, the wisdom, seven wisdom books just to go through it together, to to have a posture and an attitude of, of trying to grow in wisdom with God. But you don't treat poetic verses like Psalms the same way you treat historical or narrative or the legal books or the didactic, didactic meaning teaching, the, Tim, the, the Timothy letters and the Thessalonians, etc. You don't treat a biographical book the Gospels, the same way you treat historical Exodus. Those Gospels are, you know, the good news, Jesus saving us, yes. But they're biographies of his life, and a biography is always trying to tell you something greater than the sum of events. Matthew writes his biography of Jesus different than John. John's a lot more like Jay, and I'm a lot more like Matthew. The details. 493 fish. (laughs) There were a bunch. (laughs) John doesn't even tell it in the same order because he's trying to tell you who Jesus is at this intimate level because he was the one who was the youngest and the closest to and knew Jesus in a different way than Matthew did. And Mark and Luke got it from talking to all the disciples, not their firsthand experience. So you treat those books differently, eschatological in times. The prophetic books... So much the Old Testament. You don't read them the same way. John's revelation, when he gives that scene in heaven, six wheels and four heads, and you're just like, you ate something that went bad in dinner. Or as he's this first century guy trying to put words to something that there aren't words for in this massive vision that God's given him. And you have to use these literary rules as you kind of filter through what's being said. Uh, A little more on that in a second. Uh, Three, the perspective, we start with God, not ourselves. 
to understand ourselves and how we relate with God and how we relate with others and how we relate with each other and how we, the concept of who we are and our purpose of life, you start with God to understand ourselves. Too much of the church starts with themselves to understand God. So, God who created us male and female in his image, we return the favor and create him in our image. And we make him small. Start with God and what does God have to say? Don't proof text it or superimpose your view or attitude on scripture. Let God speak. One passage does not give you, two passages, even three passages, you cannot form and pour concrete on hard theology with just a couple passages. You have to study that whole topic in detail, the primary and secondary references to it, and that takes time. That's why you have theologians who give their lives to this, and you still have good ones and bad ones. Here's one in understanding different uh, types of literature. C, the art of descriptive versus prescriptive. I know churches. There are churches within a rock's throw of here. No, it's not Avonhead Baptist, and no, it's not Christ the King, and no, it's not St. Mark's. Churches that will remain unnamed. Where they look at Paul's words to the church at Corinth, I do not let a woman speak or teach. And then there's others who are like, seriously? You see, when you study scripture, you have to discern by looking at the whole counsel of God. In in this situation, is Paul speaking prescriptively, apply to all situations, or is he speaking descriptively? He's talking to a context with this church at this time, in this culture, in this situation, making a statement to them. You have to look at this well, and that takes skill and that takes time. We, with our theology, bubble on the level. That's a little prompt for me. Everybody knows a level, right? You're going to build something and you want want the picture to hang level. To get that bubble to stay in the center between those two lines is quite hard and the most micro, and it shifts, right? It's actually quite easy just to turn the level upside down. The bubble goes to the top and it stays there. We want our theology like that. We want it to be black and white and to the point, and we don't like it to be on the level where it's kind of... We have to work to hold the balance. But a lot of scripture has to be held in tension. A lot of the the recent church has, Jesus, that was Old Testament. Jesus was a complete pacifist until he beat them with a whip and turned over their tables and threw their money around. Until he screeched at the Pharisees, woe to you, seven times. It's complex, these two, what appear to be contradictory, but are held in the balance together. You have to wrestle with scripture and you have to hold things lightly and when it's not really clear, you have to hold it with tension. You wanna get a divide going? Let's go to morning tea and talk about creation. Hundreds of millions of years or six days? Hey, I don't care which position you take. They both take one hell of a lot of faith. And the point of Genesis is a story of relationship. And in that created order, it follows the long view of creation long before we had science labs. I don't care where you land. I'm not going to tell you where I land on it. Because it's complex and hard and I don't have a hard position. I have a bubble that's held in tension Perceiving what God is saying prayerfully and expectantly and meditate. We've got a lost art discipline of learning scripture. If we memorize scripture, we memorize something that'll fit on a bumper sticker. I call it a tic-tac, not a whole meal. We need, if we know all the lyrics of these songs, all those Beatles songs that I put up there, We should know scripture and know it deeply and know it well. We should make it a regular part of our habit and diet of digesting it deeply and do it in chunks, not a verse here and a verse there, but the whole chunk so you get the context of what's being said. And the very passe, uncool habit, no matter what language you give it to it, of daily time with God, 
setting aside the world and making an appointment. And look, I'm not talking about making it religious people. Over holiday, there were days where I didn't open Scripture and spend time in it. I may have spent time with God, but I didn't go do word study. And, 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 and even after all these years, I wrestle with God, and God's like, mate, we're on holiday, relax. <laughs> but maybe we need to get back to where it actually is a priority, because if it is a value, and we do want to know God, and we do want to understand God, and therefore understand ourselves and all the things that flow out of that, we probably should know Him well. And here, this is one of the things that brought the young adults to life. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to not have the answer. It's okay to ask hard questions. It's okay to doubt and wrestle with it and not have it all sorted. I love, I, I watch Angus's face, and he's sitting there, smoke's coming out, others are talking, and his hand starts to go up. Wait. Wait, so if, then this, so that means, and I'm just sitting there going, the guy just knocked a six. He gets it. He's wrestling. He goes, but what, how does that, I love it, because there's a safety actually to take and wrestle with God on what he's saying. Some very pragmatic skills. Two things, inductive versus deductive. Inductive, investigate, study it, tear it apart. What's going on? Who's he talking to? What's the context before and after? Why are they talking about this? Why is Jesus saying this now? Why is he saying it in that way? What actually is said and what's not said? There's four different groups of people in the, that are witnessing him say this. How did each of them receive it or hear it or why are they there? And, and just kind of do this kind of question to understand the text itself. Have the cultural ears to understand what they're saying and why they're saying it. Which means you may need to do some reading about it. Contemporary events at the time. Do you, remember, do you remember the passage where it says Jesus is telling a story and look, he's not talking about a tower. He's talking about bigger things, but he goes, who would build a tower and not have the money to finish it? You'd kind of do your accounting before you started building it. He was ripping something off the headlines of current at that very time where this big tower was being built and one of the Herods had run out of money. And everybody who kind of thought that the, the Herods were, yeah, um, they would have all chuckled because they would have known exactly what he was saying. And they would have gotten the power of an artistic metaphorical image being used to talk about deeper things. What historical realities impacted the way they heard it, including hearing it wrong? Quite often the Jews misunderstood what he said. The Pharisees misunderstood when he said, tear down this temple and in three days I'll, I'll, it'll rise again. They totally didn't get what he was saying because they totally didn't get the relationship of Israel and God and therefore Messiah with Israel. What does it mean? Quite often this is kind of like the epilogue of the story. What does it mean? The quick application, close up, Done. Context, context, context. What's being said here? You remember Luke 15? Shepherd with 100 sheep, one goes astray. Lady with 10 coins, loses one. Father with two sons, loses one of them. Quite often, and I've done it, and it's not inaccurate to do it this way unless you don't get to the other part, which is the story's actually not about the first son that we call the prodigal. The story actually hinges on the barb at the end with the older brother which ends not knowing the decision because the story ends with the father making this appeal to the older brother and the story ends and you don't know how he's going to respond to the father. And it's actually a message about God in that special relationship with Israel. And yes, it's about each one of us, but we quite often miss that. In inductive, you need some good tools. Compare translations, NIV, NASB, ESV, NRSV. Compare them because groups of really smart people get together and wrestle very different languages. Oop, back. Wrestle, how do we translate that word? And I've used this before. In English, being in New Zealand, understanding our cultural complexity, 
in one word translate mana? Impossible. And if you choose a word, you'll choose the best, but it'll be incomplete. So they have to wrestle and they choose different words. But the words have different meanings because language uses them differently. Hebrew is actually socially, anthropologically closer to Maori than it is to English. They have a fraction of the number of words we have. And contextually and how they're used and how they're strung together is important. Use good commentaries by trustworthy people. N.T. Wright, Tim Keller. Study them. Once you're well equipped and you've, you've got a good handle on theology and God's word, then maybe you study some of the people who are a little more... Uh, I love Rob Bell. He's a flaming heretic, but I love him. Because some of the things he said, wow, that's powerful. I love um, Richard Rohr, Catholic monk, priest, does a lot of stuff, particularly around men in the second half of life stuff. Love him, powerful stuff. But I, sometimes I have to go, Richard, you're a flaming heretic. <laughs> that point four under five, similar stories. Those biographers, gospel writers, tell some of the stories are told several times, but a little bit different way because they're making different points because they're different people in different contexts, writing to different audiences, and so you compare them. And then you go, so what do I do with this? The next one, deductive. This is kind of like when you study a topic or you're trying to put together your thoughts on a topic. Marriage. Gender sexual issues, women in the church, raising kids, whatever. But when you do deductive, you've got to look across the whole council of Scripture. An Old Testament passage and New Testament passages have to be weighted differently, not more or less differently. Different kinds of literature. And basically, you have to do an inductive study of each passage you're going to use to form some type of deductive topic Conclusion, it requires a lot of pursuit. Pursue the word chesed. Chesed. Often translated everlasting or trustworthy, depending on context. But it's a word about the unconditional, unchangeable love of God for us. You can't merit it, you can't unmerit it. But to completely, you just go through scripture and you just study every time that word is used and how it's used in that. And you got to think about it and take notes and wrestle. And when it's not clear, you just hold it in tension. The both and approach. Sometime, you know, when we walked up that mountain, sometime we were in these trees and as far as I could see was myself to Mark. And it was beautiful and cool. Dark, shaded. My sunglasses were too much. It, it made it too dark to see because it was almost like rainforests, multiple canopies. But you're up close. You do a word study. And other times, we were on these peaks where I could see up these valleys where they filmed Lord of the Rings and such. And then you begin to notice there's a, a ridge of peaks that are sub-peaks that are forming a second higher valley paralleling the main and I'm seeing this bigger landscape of what's going on and I can see all the way to the sea and all the way to the center of the Alpine range and it's such a different perspective than being down in those trees both are important I remember when I was encouraged to start reading through the Bible in a year and as I read through the Bible in a year and I did it over and over and over you start getting these trends in understanding these character traits, understanding who we are in ways that small, direct passages don't address. When you read all, both of the Samuels, by the way, did you know that First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings were one book at one time, and they broke them up because they're so big, the Samuel era and the post-Samuel era. But when you read that, those four books and you read it over and over again, things start to pop out and come to the service that are there, but they're not talked about in a didactic teaching way. 
You got to do both to get a full understanding and knowing and engagement with God. Compare and do interlinear with your Gospels where they line up the stories chronologically. And this is important. Study alone and study in community. Do it by yourself. Make that habit. Seek it. Pursue it. Listen to it in your car. Listen to it while you prepare a meal. Listen to it as you walk. Study it and read it and circle it and underline and highlight and take notes in the margins. And do it together. And every one of those levels is important. There's something when you have two or three study it, a triad of people, men or women studying it together. You develop the intimacy and the vulnerability to be able to wrestle and challenge one another with a blind spot. A little bit larger when you get four to six to eight, it changes dynamics, but there's still enough room and space to talk about issues in detail. But when you get larger, and a lot of our life groups are way too big, they're really classes, not life groups. Because there's so many people in the room that there's no way you're going to share what you're wrestling with. And there's no way you're going to share failings. And there's no way you'll ask that question because you'd feel stupid. There are more classes. But sometimes levels of that kind of development are important. And then it's important as an entire church and even a diocese and the church. What is God doing in and amongst us now? Where is he taking us tomorrow And then the variables. My prayer at the beginning of people of all nations and all intergenerationally here together, there's something of approaching the word because a church that is full of retired people and a church that is all young people are going to have blind spots. A church that is all white or a church that is all brown are going to have blind spots. There is such a richness when these differences come together, who never thought about it that way. Hmm. And you sense the Spirit touching you with what that person so different than you is bringing up. And last one. There's something about journaling. There's something when you slow down the, from a keyboard, when you slow down from just extemporaneously talking, and you write. I'm not going to get into the brain mechanics of that, But there's something when you journal it and you are forced at slower speed to put concepts into words and you wrestle with God with what's being said or you pick up on things that God's saying to you because it forces you to put them into words. And you don't treat the so what as an epilogue of the study, but it becomes half your study. I've been doing all of this study on this. Now what are you saying to me? You've heard me say before in society, in our society today, we're more shaped by the outside than we are this book. And so if John were given a promotion to Auckland, well, of course John's going to take it because it's such a great honor and opportunity and salary. But if he went, he would have to give up leading that congregation of people with all types of special needs What does God want him to do? God may want him to go. God very well may want him to thank you for that. I'm called to stay and remain here. He's got to discern that. Journaling helps you do that. He can wrestle with the word all day long. You've got to wrestle with God. The word is not there to give you a manual. It's there to help you engage and relate. The result is those things. That's the result. That's the result of God's word. That's the result of knowing and walking with God. Here's one of the things I said to my wife, and then I went away and wrote it down. She didn't know I went away and wrote it down. She probably doesn't remember me saying it. Quite often I bladder on, and she just, "Uh uh-huh. She told me one night, honey, I'm going to sleep now. Stop talking. (laughs) I got to process I tire, as a pastor and teacher, I tire of programs. I do. I tire of conjoling people to help and sign up programs. I'm tired of programs as the understanding expression 
of engaging with God. Programs are great. All the, all the things we've begun in the past two and a half years since I've gotten here are what I told the, the diocesan magazine when they interviewed me on all that stuff was, and they titled it, she picked up on it and titled it, Everything's Mainly Music. <laughs> Moving in music, Esau, um, 24-7, everything's mainly music. They're just containers for redemptive relationship. The magic is in the relationship, not in the program. I just tie, and the reason we do that is because as Christians in the West who don't know God at that passionate, deep level, we don't have the competence or even the courage or desire to go love people in redemptive relationship without program. I tire of program. I swear I do. I tire of beige church. Do you get that? Where everything's just beige. You know, you, you go on, on any of your, your uh, photo editing software and just move everything to Serpia. I tire of beige church. I long for church in color, expression and freedom. And quite often it goes to beige because we're just so critical of each other versus celebrating each other. I long for God to speak and move and powerfully transform lives. And, and we, we always picture Jesus as the lamb, not the lion. I love Lewis and Tolkien giving us these myths to understand ourselves. Tolkien said, Lord of the Rings is the myth for the British people to conceive themselves, to conceptualize themselves. And Lewis, when he wrote Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, there's Lucy engaging with the beaver, and she's going to meet Aslan, and she goes, I I is he safe? No, he's not safe. He's a lion. Well, is he good? He's always good. To know him beyond controlling him in beige. Any other gathering of the church is just... Noise. I told the staff we need to eradicate this phrase from our church. We need to get them along to church. No, we don't need to get anybody along to church. We need to introduce people to Jesus. Now, that sounds Pentecostal, and I absolutely mean it. We need to introduce people to the living God who has so much to say to us. And if you haven't fallen in love with his word I don't care if you're pious or religious or not. Just fall in love with him through his word. All that happens on its own. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the things you're doing in and amongst us. Thank you for the challenges of who you want us to be and what you want us to do. But God, thank you for wanting to know us relationally, beyond words. Thank you for calling us to floor time and speaking so deeply with us. In Jesus' name we pray.